cases, and I can tell you without any hesitation that this has made the biggest impact on my practice. It's everything I do. So I do a lot of cataract, glaucoma, refractive, oculoplastics in our practice, even retina. And I tell you, it's very, very... I think he wants it for that video. <laughs> um, but, and so I'm going to use this microphone mostly for the video. Hi, everybody. So, the, the issue for me is, is really, you know, when you look at any new procedure, you look at the value add. Does it bring value? Does it, does it bring you know, benefits to patients, to the office, financially, flow, etc.? And we see from multiple levels, it's, it's made a huge impact on our practice. And so I, I really want to share that with you because I don't think I appreciated the impact floaters had on patients' quality of life until I started performing. You know, we were so used to ignoring floaters and, and conditioning ourselves as well as our patients that nothing can be done. And historically, I think we've seen that with multiple different parts, of, multiple different subspecialties. You know, I think, I think in, in ocular surface disease and cataracts, we never cared about dry eye until we had solutions for it or diagnostic tools. You know, cataract surgery itself, we surgery is much earlier because technology has changed. So we're going to get through all of that and I want to share with you some of the pearls that I've learned along the way uh, about how to maximize safety and efficacy as well. Uh, I do have three kids. They're my future ophthalmologists and the making future visual license surgeons as well. And a little bit more about me, I'm actually a, a uh, musician as well. One of my other passions in life is playing keyboards for a band called Funkadesi, which is a mix between Indian funk and reggae. So if you ever go online, YouTube, iTunes, you can just look up Funka Desi and you'll see us on a lot of videos and things online. So hopefully you enjoy that. But back to visualizers. So why visualizers? Well, I think there's a paradigm shift in ophthalmology in general uh, to really a focus on quality of life. And I think from, from cataracts, refracted, even retina now, we're seeing there's a big push to help patient satisfaction, <laughs> patient's quality of life. And I think there's a, a lot of skepticism with this procedure. Now, how I got involved, I never thought, as a glaucoma specialist, as a glaucoma fellowship trained doctor, I never thought I'd be involved with speaking on vitreolysis, floater treatment. That was the last thing on my mind. What happened in my case, my dad's an ophthalmologist, and so he had a very old laser that he would not get rid of. Even though I begged and pleaded, please, dad, it's old. He said, no, no, son, it's fine. Don't worry, it's fine. Finally, it died. Well, just before it died, a primary MD, a general practitioner, a friend of mine, went to the East Coast for, to, do a, to get the procedure done by a colleague, Dr. Karakoff, the kind of the father figure of vitrolysis. This doctor, a friend of mine, used to come to me every year for agrial eye exams and would say, I have this large floater, can you take care of it? And I said, nothing to do, just leave it, live with it, right? Like we all do. I sent him to a retina specialist, and the retina specialist said, he's a physician, He's 50 and he's faking. I'm not going to touch his eye. It's not worth it. So he suffered. He finally went to the East Coast, came back and said, look, please look at my eye. It's gone. The floater's gone. The laser will take care of it. So okay. And true enough, it was gone. A week later, American Academy of Ophthalmology was in Chicago. My dad and I went downtown and Ellis had just come out with the laser, Ultra Cure Reflex, specifically designed for floater removal and floater treatment. We bought the laser because we needed a YAG laser anyway. So we weren't looking to buy a vitrolysis, but they said, hey, this does this also, so why not try it? So I thought, okay, fine. So I was the first one in the United States to buy the laser. I did 10, 20, 30, 50, and next thing you know, I'm thinking, wow, this is really working. And patients are starting to tell more patients. And next thing you know, we're doing more and more, and now we're doing 30 a week. But I realized very early on, there was truly an impact on patients' quality of life that I never appreciated until we started doing that. We'll talk more about that. But unfortunately, I, I met with a lot of skepticism from my colleagues. And I'm sure there are people here who are thinking, well, does it really work or not? And, and there are risks and there's some fears, of course, no complications. There is a, there's a perception that it doesn't work because some of the older studies that were published were using technology that was not optimized for floater treatment. And really the question is, why now? What has changed all of a sudden that we're reintroducing floater treatment to the community? And so we're gonna talk about what has changed we're going to talk about really why there's a value to, change, to treating these patients. Now, I use cataract surgery as a great analogy of why the changes of philosophies occur. Think about a cataract. How many people wait till a cataract is ripe anymore in 2200 and do surgery? A lot of us, if, if patients complain, night vision, quality of vision, can't drive, can't read, you see a cataract and say, why wait? If they have symptoms affecting daily life, we treat it. The same thing with floaters. If I see someone who has a floater, that's the same issue. 
And so to me, it's not just an annoyance. It's something that really does impact their daily functioning. And so I always tell patients, even though it's a normal process, it does not mean we have to ignore it because now we have new technology. There was actually an interesting uh, publication back in 2011 by Wadley, published in American Journey of Ophthalmology. It's basically, in this study, they asked patients, what are you willing to risk to get rid of your disease state? And people with floaters were willing to risk as much, if not more, than people with HIV, strokes, diabetes, and other disease processes. Seven out of 10 people in the study that they found will have a floater sometime in their life. 30% of those will have chronic floaters that may be debilitating in their life. So there's a number of patients out there walking around our communities that are truly suffering, that are being ignored. And so for us, I don't look at this as a replacement for retracting. So for those retina surgeons out there, this is not a replacement. This is a step before needing a retracting. This is for that patient who has a white screen, who has a clump, who has a cloud, who you say, it's not worth doing a retracting for this patient because of the potential risks, although these risks have gotten much better with newer retractable machines, there's still a risk of going in the eye. And so this is, to me, more of a step before that as well, because some people do need retractable, and we'll talk about that too as well. Just a recap for those of us who forgot about how floaters form. Basically, the vitreous is made up of type two collagen. And what happens, we get a, and, and these, these collagen fibers have hyaluronic acid that surrounds them and has a negative charge to keep each collagen fiber repelled. And so what happens is we lose that negative charge, so the fibers clump together, basically. We get depolymerization, which causes those collagen fibers to clump together, change the vitreous and cause the PVDs to form, and we get other changes as well. So there's really type two collagen that's clumping together because of the loss of the negative charge as well. So that's kind of what's happening to our vitreous. But what has changed, what was the problem? Why were previous attempts at vitreolysis not as successful? Well, Today I'm going to focus a lot on these three categories. Number one, most of my talk is going to be about visualization. Historically, we did not have a great way of visualizing behind the posterior capsule. So number one, identifying the floater, but number two, giving ourselves that spatial context. Where are we in the vitreous to make sure that we're safe to fire? Previous studies were using energy levels that were very low, like a YAG capsulotomy, one or two millijoules. Well, as we'll talk about today, we sometimes will use five, six, seven millijoules to achieve that plasma and that vaporization that we want to achieve. Number of shots. Even though these are YAG lasers that we're using, it's not a YAG capsulotomy. This is a very different procedure. Therefore, not only are energy levels different, but also the number of shots. We're not just using 20 shots or 30 shots like a YAG capsulotomy. We're using 150, 250, 300 shots oftentimes to get rid of these floaters. And so there's a fear factor of using too many shots. We'll also talk about the energy delivery and the energy efficiency of this new laser system as well. So what equipment do you need? The beautiful thing is not much different than you have now. A specifically designed YAG laser like you see there from LX, of course, is one. You see uh, a lens. This is one that we've helped Vol create. And then typical drops that you do for your yeah, capsulotomy. So nothing very different than what you already all have pretty much in your offices. So what has LX changed? What has technology changed? Again, I'm going to talk about this idea of coaxial illumination, titratable illumination, the view and how we can maximize that view into the vitreous and to find those floaters. The energy delivery, the more efficient energy delivery, and our understanding, we have a better awareness of what's happening to the energy when you fire a laser into the vitreous. And then we'll talk about the actual cavity of the laser. These cavities that they created allow us to fire thousands of shots without it overheating. How many of you have fired a laser more than 20 times and beep, reset, and fire again, beep, reset? Well, with this, these air cooling cavities they have, you can fire literally, I've done it, 10,000 shots at one time, just keep going, and it will not overheat. And if you look at the fluence and the energy delivery, it is, it's stable versus many other cavities degrade over time, especially if you fire too many shots. So we'll talk about that in more detail. So let's talk about visualization. I'm going to spend most of my time on this topic because I think this is the most important reason why we now can feel better about treating patients. So when we use YAG lasers, we're thought, we're, our thinking is yeah, capsulotomies and LPIs, right? So all we care about is seeing the anterior segment and maybe the posterior capsule. That's it. That's all we really care about. So how do they design the ag lasers? 
They designed it basically with the idea of the anterior segment in mind. So you have a illumination tower coming from below, a non-coaxial position. So the illumination tower is coming from here, your aiming beam and your oculars are coming from this axis, so they converge at the posterior capsule, which is great. That's what you want for those anterior type of segment procedures. But if you have a floater in the middle or posterior vitreous, if you have an illumination tower coming from below, and your laser and oculars are coming from a different optical pathway, they crisscross. So not only can we not identify a lot of the symptomatic floaters, but we can't give ourselves that real-time spatial awareness. Where's the floater and where's the retina? How far am I from those different structures? So what LX has done with their laser reflex systems is they've allowed us to actually keep the illumination tower and the laser and oculars on the same optical pathway by this mirror that flips out of the way. So there is the illumination, and then that mirror goes out of the way to allow the laser to fire. So you're giving yourself what we call true coaxial illumination. Now, there are some lasers out there that are using what we call a split mirror system. A split mirror system basically is a way around that by having two mirrors that converge to the back of the eye to give you a pseudo coaxial appearance. And it does work for some patients, but as we'll talk about, it doesn't allow you to titrate the illumination. And we'll get into that in more detail. So true coaxial illumination is what this laser has. Now, I'm gonna talk about a couple concepts. And the first concept is this idea of the slow lamp position. So when we're here and the slit is in the middle position, that's called on axis or fully coaxial. When your slit lamp is in the center, you have 100% of the light going into the, to the back of the eye. It allows you to see a beautiful red reflex. So when we're on axis or coaxial 100%, we have a beautiful red reflex and we can see all the way to the retina. And what we give ourselves is the ability to see is the floater in focus and is the retina obscured. If the retina is blurry or you cannot see it during the procedure and the floater is in focus, you have more than enough space to fire. That's how we know how far we are. If the retina is in focus at the same time as the floater, then we say to ourselves, do not fire. I'm gonna show you many videos that, that explain this concept. But that's more for posterior or, or middle of vitreous. What about anterior floaters? Well, sometimes you can fire the laser with a slow lamp in the oblique position or off axis position. Why? Because sometimes you don't want all that red reflex. If you have too much red reflex, you can't see the contrast. So you can move the slow ample beat, bleak, and get rid of some of that. And that allows us to have better contrast with the floater and also see where the posterior capsule is in some of those patients. So here's an example of on axis, and if I move the slow ample oblique, it's off axis. And what that does, again, changes the amount of illumination. So coaxially, you have a nice red reflex. When I move it oblique, you lose that red reflex. So again, we're going to talk about why this is so important. Depending on where those floaters are in the vitreous, we'll have to use one of the other techniques and somewhere in between as well. So let's show you some videos. And I'm going to kind of go through some of these videos with you as well because I think it's important to understand. So here's an example of a white string in the middle to posterior vitreous, as you want posterior vitreous. You see a clump there. Now focus on the floater. I go back to the retina. I go back to the floater. So I can see all the way to the retina. I'm fully coaxial. I see the floaters in focus, the retina is obscure. Even though I see it, it's very difficult to make out. I know I'm far enough away to fire safely. Now when I start firing, you see the aiming beams there, I'm firing, it is breaking up the pieces. So the question is, well now, you're gonna cause one floater to go into 15 floaters, and the patient's gonna be very upset with you. How do we avoid that? The difference between a YAG capsulotomy and vitrolysis is number one, higher energy levels, we're using six millijoules in this case, but also, we're not stopping at just 20 shots like a YAG capsulotomy. We're going to keep going. We're, there is plasma. Plasma is a fourth state of matter, solid to gaseous state. So when you have plasma, you create gases, nitrogen and other gases that gets absorbed in the eye. But it's occurring in a very small area. So you break and then vaporize, break and vaporize. So your end point for a lot of these white rings, visually, is resolution. You should not see any more. You're going to keep going until you stop or you don't see any more. So it may take 200, 300 shots, unlike a YAG capsulotomy. And in our studies, I'll show you later on, majority of Weissman patients, one session is all you need to get rid of their symptoms. In the patients who had any residual amounts of floaters still left over, small pieces, 70% of those, they neuroadapted. A very small proportion of patients still had res uh, residual floaters that we had to do a second session. 
So majority of patients, one session is all we see, and that's been replicated in other studies as well. I'll show you some data later on. But as you see here, it's, it's resolved. The floater's gone. I'll show you another example of, of a floater. <coughs> Here's an example of really of a simple, small one, but the importance of coaxial illumination. So there's that floater in the middle of the vitreous, right in the center. Now coaxial, 100% of the light is in the center. But if I move it oblique, I can't see it very well. So I move it back to the center. I go back, there's the retina. I go back, where's the lens? There it is. I know exactly where I am. I'm in the middle of the vitreous. Again, I'm gonna keep going with this concept because understanding where you are in the vitreous is the key to being safe, but also to finding out where you are and to feel aggressive if you need to be as well. So now I know I'm safe. There's no structures I'm gonna hit. It's a pseudophagic patient. I can feel comfortable firing. And actually, once you get more comfortable, you can fire it. This laser allows you to do four shots per second. So you can't really fire that fast. <laughs> so you can fire as fast as you can, and it will not uh, give up on you. And so these patients, sometimes within a few minutes, their, their floaters are gone when you feel very comfortable, especially in a situation like this. And again, you're gonna keep going until you vaporize, you break, vaporize. My terminology, I'll have to tell Mike, is called breakerizing. <laughs> They're breaking and vaporizing, combination. So one, here's one, a, one, one, Yes. <clears throat> Where is your point of focus? On the floor there? behind the floater, in front of the floater. So, great question. So where's your focus? That's, we're gonna talk about energy delivery because when you fire a laser, there's an acoustic wave of energy around it and then the plasma comes back towards you. So plasma is actually a shield. There's been, and Dr. Steiner did a great uh, paper in 1983 that talks about when you have a plasma formation, it forms a shield that protects it from growing further back. So most of the, floor, uh, most of the energy comes back towards you. I'll talk to you about that. What I do, is I put it at a zero offset. There's actually offsets on these here. You can go 100, 500 microns posteriorly, 500 microns anteriorly. I keep it at zero, make sure I've set my accommodation and make sure I set my oculars, and then I fire and see what's happening. Honestly, the best thing to do is not worry about posterior and anterior. I use my aiming beams, I fire a aim just on the floater if I can, and then if I see it, if I press and see it, Busting, great. If not, I move a hair posteriorly. And then I, I use real-time feedback to tell me where, where I have to go. But technically, you can f aim just a hair behind it, and that will, like a yak caps lot of me almost as well. Absolutely, great point. Uh, so here's an example of a, of a typical Y screen, another large Y screen. And I'm showing these videos because these are all coaxial. And you can see the retina is out of focus, right? Without coaxial illumination, you won't have that view. That coaxial view gives you that red reflex, allows you to see where the retina is. So knowing that I'm not even close to the retina, I don't have to worry about firing and hitting it. And we'll talk more about energy in, in a few minutes. But here again, I focus it. Now this is a green aiming beam. I'm using a different laser here. But the bottom line is you keep going. You break, keep going. Break, keep going. Break, keep going. And it may take a few hundred shots. But the difference between the YAG capsulotomy and this is we're using higher levels of energy, sometimes five, six, seven millijoules, and we keep going three, 400 shots sometimes until it vaporizes as much as we can see in our, in our visualization. And you see the nerve is back there, but it's very, very, very obscure. I know I'm safe to fire. Even though I see it, it's very obscure. You can see I'm just gonna keep going until I keep breaking these things up. And I'm firing pretty fast, like a machine gun. <laughs> So that was coaxial, right? So what I was showing you just now is the slow lamp in the middle position, 100% of the light going to the back of the eye, nice red reflex. What I want to show you now is the importance of sometimes moving it oblique. So I'll show you something here. Here's an example of a floater. Now this floater is a large amorphous cloud behind a fake patient lens. So I'm a little worried now. I say, you know, I can't tell where I am. So what I can do is I can go ahead and stop and I can move the slow lamp oblique. Now by moving it oblique, what have I done? I've removed 100% of that coaxial illumination. Now I have oblique illumination, basically, by moving it all the way out. So now I have better contrast here. I can see the floater better, and if I need to know where the posterior capsule is, I can tell, and I'll show you how. So here I, I stop, and I say, okay, wait a minute, let me see, where is that posterior capsule? Okay, there is the, the lens. So how do I know how far I am away from a lens? Well, I go back and I stop. The distance between here and here, basically, that distance is analogous to the AC depth, right? So when we, when we measure the anterior chamber depth, right, what do we do? We move our slow level oblique, we look at the endothelium of the cornea, 
we go to the iris, we say, okay, AC depth, three millimeters, it's normal depth. I use that same analogy, and I remember that depth for the patient, and then I go, okay, this is at least about an AC depth, so I'm at least three millimeters. That's how I can appreciate, am I far enough away from the lens to fire? So now I have a good view, I can see I'm far enough away and I can keep firing. Now these are the amorphous type of clouds. Unlike a white screen, these amorphous clouds are significant and they do affect patients' quality of life. And you can do amazing, amazing jobs for these patients. It just might take more number of shots as well as more number of sessions. Because the more diffuse they are, the less dense these are, the less they absorb the energy. So it takes a lot of shots to kind of vaporize and break and vaporize and break. So I tell a lot of patients ahead of time, I show them videos on my phone, I'll, I'll show you that in a second. But I take videos and I tell patients, this laser's safe. It doesn't blow up the eye, it's a very microscopic area of vaporization. It might take us multiple sessions to remove all of it. But hopefully after each session, you notice an improvement. And it's in our studies, most of these patients say, yes, doc, 30, 40, 50, 60% better, but they're willing to do another session if they have to. So that's, that's more amorphous clouds, and this is more in the anterior vitreous. So let's talk about something else. So that was, I talked to you about coaxial illumination, and then I talked to you about going oblique. So this little lamp going all the way this way. Now, what I think is probably the most impressive, unique characteristic of these lasers is the ability not only to fire coaxial and off-axis, but anywhere in between. So anywhere in between you can fire. Why is that important? We can titrate the amount of illumination, the amount of coaxial illumination, to maximize our contrast with the floater, but still have enough coaxial illumination to know where the retina is. I'll show you some examples. So this is a video where I'm here, and you can see what I'm doing with my silt lamp, and a laser, and on the right is what my view is in my oculars and from a recording. So you can see here, as I, as I view, there's a nice white ring. You can see that white ring, and I'm looking. There's a white ring. I go through, there's a retina. So they're all far enough away. Great. Now what I can do, if you look on the left here, with my slit lamp right here, if I move it oblique, I can change how much coaxial illumination is occurring. If I go all the way oblique, I lose it. I need some coaxial illumination. Now as I move it towards the center, I bring back in some of that coaxial illumination. So now it's too much glare. So I can say, okay, let me move it five degrees oblique. What I've done just now is I've removed some of the extra coaxial illumination anteriorly to give myself better contrast, but I still know that the retina is out of focus because of the, of the coaxial. So you can titrate off some of that extra glare to maximize the contrast. So here's another example of one here where it's a large amorphous cloud, faking page. So what I do here is if I move it all the way oblique, I cannot see the floater. If I move it directly in the center, too much glare, hard to see the contrast of the floater. So I can go ahead and move it maybe five degrees oblique, 10 degrees oblique, and look what happens. I remove some of the anterior glare, but I have enough coaxial to know the retina is out of focus. I can still see the retina. That is called titratable illumination. And only this laser system, only the reflex lasers, can give you that smooth transition of the illumination. And so, again, I know I'm spending a lot of time on, on visualization, but this is the key to safety, as well as efficacy identifying those floaters. Uh oh We need to see? We need to have a, we need to have a, a, a new cavity. We need to put Ellis cavity in this one. <laughs> All right, good. We're back. We're back in action. Good. So let's see if I can show you here. Uh, okay. Um, showing you again another titration. There's a red reflex. I see a nice thick opacity. I can change my illumination by moving it oblique a little bit, and I can see the floater with much better contrast. So, so much, just like MIG surgery, just like cataract surgery, visualization is the heart and soul of what allows us to feel safe when we're, when we're doing the procedure. So, just showing you here, I'm breaking up this denser plaque. It's a nice thick white string there. And this may take, I'm using about six and a half millimeters, and it might take a number of shots to break it up. So you're debulking, you're breaking it up. I mean, it's, but you're, but you're not just pushing it away. Yes? Is it better to shoot in the center of the floater or at the end? Ah, where, what's better? Now, I will give you my professional answer, but then I'll give you my real world answer. <laughs> Ideally, you actually should fire, I think, on the top of the floater as much as possible because gas bubbles, right, from the plasma, a lot of times push it up. So I like to start at the top. Realistically, 
whatever you see. <laughs> I mean, there's no perfect science, but yes, I like to start at the top because if you start at the bottom, it starts to force it to go up. So I like to start at the top if I can. But you know, it's going to behave differently, and so depending how it moves and how it changes, you may have to fire wherever you can see it. And then you have to sometimes move the eye a little bit up and down to move the floater, or you can like, really te tease it into an area that you can see better. Um, all right, let me see if I can fast forward through some of these. Here, just to give you an example, here's a floater uh, where I'm showing you how to titrate the elimination again. So here, nice big massive cloud in the middle of vitreous here. So that's a posterior capsule. If I move it posteriorly, I keep marching back, I can see in a second a nice white cloud. There you go. So now that distance is really the safety distance. Now I'm well over four or five millimeters. So I know that I'm deep enough into the vitreous to fire without hitting that lens. And that's again how we appreciate using oblique illumination, but not fully oblique. That's coaxial there. I can see the retina's out of focus. So good. Then I can move it slightly oblique to get rid of some of that extra glare. Again, this is, this is what takes the learning curve. This is what takes time to understand how to maximize the benefits of this laser. If you just sit down and start firing without learning this, you're not gonna utilize it the best you can. That's what take, took me literally you know, months and months and hundreds and hundreds of patients to really develop this and technique and learn it. So, multifocals, anybody does some multifocal lenses here? Multifocality? Well, people ask me, does it work on multifocal lenses? And it does. In fact, we'll show you some data on higher order aberrations, trefoil, coma, quality of vision. And in these multifocal lens patients, these amorphous clouds, they can make a huge impact on your quality of vision patients. In fact, I have a series of multifocal patients where they were J3, J5, they were not able to see through the visual lysis. Yeah, cap was redone many months ago, and they could see J1 all of a sudden. They're, these work very well. The only caveat to a multifocal lens is if you're in one of the rings, it doesn't cause a laser to bounce off. What it'll do though is because the YAG laser has two laser beams that come to a converging point, it, it may cut off one of those beams, and so nothing will happen. So you fire, and nothing happens. And so it doesn't hurt the eye, nothing's gonna, it's from a safety perspective, but you have to be more in the middle optic to get the optimal uh, power. Now, that was on-off axis, on-off axis, titratable illumination. I wanna to talk to you about something else before we move on in terms of YAG capsulotomy. So even though we talk about float removal and float treatment with this laser, this laser does amazing YAG caps. How many of you here do YAG capsulotomy now? Do you ever notice after doing a YAG capsulotomy that patients say, Doc, I have more floaters all of a sudden after the YAG laser, right? Right, right? Once in a while it happens? You know, we try our best, whatever technique we use to get rid of any, any small pieces, but it's hard to see sometimes. I want to show you is how we can utilize the coaxial illumination to identify small remnants that are there after the VAG capsulotomy to get rid of those and to help prevent patients from complaining. So I'll show you here a video of, of one of my patients here around pretty much done with the VAG capsulotomy here. What you can see, I want to go coaxial. And all of a sudden you see all these small little remnants here, all these small pieces that I couldn't see when I was oblique. So when you're oblique, you can kind of, there's one piece there, you can see, but if I go coaxial, all of a sudden these small refractile pieces show up. In other words, what coaxial illumination does, it highlights those pieces when, but versus when you're oblique, you can't see them. And so now my technique involves doing a little double check at the end to make sure there's no obvious refractile pieces. And we did a study that we presented at ASCRS last year, and what was really interesting is we did a study comparing the reflex laser with the standard non-reflex lasers. And we found that basically after four, after two to four weeks here, in patients who had the reflex laser, 0% of patients complained of floaters, and in a regular laser group, 37% of patients still had floaters uh, after the YAG capsulotomy. So we were actually able to decrease the symptomology that we create uh, after YAG capsulotomy, which is kind of fun. Before I move on, any questions on visualization on how this is different than a standard YAG laser? Is that pretty clear from the tower? Good. And please stop me anytime. If you guys have any questions and comments, please feel free. So moving on to the second part of our discussion of what's changed, energy delivery. Because one of the most common questions I receive is, Doc, aren't you scared to fire six, seven millijoules, 300 shots? That's a lot of energy in the eye, and it's gonna cause inflammation and detachments and you know, cause a lot of problems. And CME, 
And we'll talk about data, but let's talk about the energy and our understanding, our appreciation of what's happening. So first of all, a standard YAG laser, you have a rise and fall of the energy, right? What LX has done is they've truncated that energy beam. They've created a sharper rise and sharper fall. Now what that does is increases efficiency. The way I think about it, I'm a dumb guy. So the way I think about it, I say, okay, if you have a wood and you're trying to chop the wood, doing this slowly is not gonna chop it versus faster, right? You get, you get, you get better uh, efficacy and break. So it's the same idea. Sharper rise and fall increases efficiency. Therefore, less energy is needed to cause plasma spark and air. So more efficient, up to 40% more efficient than a standard OEM cavity. So number two, it's a three nanosecond pulse. Four nanoseconds by the time it gets to the eye. Why is that important? Because the question is, you're firing, and there's plasma, which is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit in that small micron area. So you're gonna cause heat to keep building up. It's gonna cause problems. Well, if you look at studies that have shown the heat is dissipated well before the second shot can be fired. We're not fast enough. So heat is not building up despite how fast we try to fire because it's such a short duration. Now, the next two slides are the most crucial slides when we talk about understanding what is happening to the energy. So, when we fire any ad laser into the vitreous, you fire the laser from here's us, the laser's going in here. Now you have a, when you fire, you have a plasma, you have an acoustic shock wave that occurs around that, that, that spot. This forms actually a shield. This plasma that forms a shield that prevents from further propagation posteriorly. So unlike what people are fearful of the retina, it's actually not as much of an issue because the shock wave has a small area behind it, but majority of the plasma, majority of the energy is actually coming back towards you. So the energy is coming more this way, not that way. So that's important because when we talk about hitting the retina, it's actually worried about, I'm more worried about hitting the lens if I'm too close to the lens. And so this is what's happening. The plasma is coming back towards you, which is why for YAC capsulotomies, we aim a little bit behind the capsule because of that property. Now, this distance between here and here, so that distance is called the convergence zone. Think of it as a total shock wave, the total dispersion of energy. Now the next slide is, uh, to me, I think the most important slide in terms of energy. When people ask me, how are you feeling comfortable firing at five or six millijoules, I tell them, look at this slide. The relationship between how much energy on the laser and how much dispersion of energy in the eye is non-linear. <coughs> Meaning, when I increase the energy on the laser, I am not linearly increasing the amount of dispersion in the eye. So for instance, this is high-speed photography and, and liquid interface, and liquid. You see here, at one millijoule, 110 microns of that dispersion. When you go to 10 millijoules, a 10 times tenfold increase in energy on a laser, you only nearly double, not even double, the convergence, the uh, dispersion. So from 110 to 210 microns. So when we're at five or six millijoules, we're less than 200 microns of dispersion of energy, which is why we feel comfortable going two millimeters behind the lens, or two millimeters in front of the retina, because of that property. And that's why when the float is in focus and retina is out of focus, you, we're, we're well beyond that two millimeter zone, and we feel comfortable firing. So just to, just to take it to the next level, we did something kind of fun. I thought this was great. This was what really made me feel comfortable. I was still skeptical. Uh, I was a skeptic until about maybe a year after I did it, and I did this test, and I said, wow, now I realize how safe it is. We held a B-scan, we had a actually one of the reps from LX holding the B-scan probe during the procedure itself. Now what I wanted to see was what was happening to the vitreous. What was, was there any traction, any pulling, was there significant changes at seven millijoules, which is a pretty high amount of energy. So you see a large, a large opacity here in the B-scan, now what you're also gonna see is these lines, all these lines on this video. Those lines are not energy. That's not, that's artifact from the clicking of the sound of the, of the laser, the click it makes. What I want you to focus on though, is what's happening behind this area here where we're firing. How little movement is occurring in the vitreous and how quiet the vitreous is. So here we go. Those lines are artifact. I'm firing here, but look at that. You're, this is moving, 
but the vitreous is not changing. We're not seeing a large explosion in the vitreous. We're not seeing changes or detrajecting or pulling, like a leaving of a tractor where you see it pulling and cutting. So in terms of the amount of disruption, we're not seeing it extend very, very far beyond where our plasma is occurring, which I thought was very important to me from a safety perspective. Here's an example. Uh, I'm just going to show you a video. Now, why am I showing this video? This video is it's important for everybody here to realize. Do not try this, what I'm going to show you, until you've had a lot of experience. But I'm showing this video to show how concentrated, this is, at, this is actually at six, milli, six and a half millijoules, how close I am to the posterior capsule, to show you how concentrated that energy is. So here I am. Where is it? There we go. So now I'm going to, sorry, I'm, I'm verbally showing this here. I was uh, narrating this video, so I, I, I muted it for now. Okay, so this is a um, coaxial. You see all those little floaters there, right? So I, I go oblique to see the floaters. There's a posterior capsule, and you're gonna see in a second here, these floaters that are literally right behind. Sorry about the quality of the video here, but see this white, white, see that white stuff there? It's literally about a millimeter behind the capsule. So there's a floater and there's the capsule. So I have less than a millimeter. Now, do not try this, please. But I was, okay, I can do this. So I added 150 micron offset posteriorly on the laser. And at about six and a half millijoules, you're gonna see how close I am to the, to the lens. So if, so if this really was a, I don't know what happened now. Oh, yeah, it's a video. If this really was a large explosion, we would have hit the lens. See what I'm saying? So that's how concentrated that shock wave is. It's at a large explosion. So I want to show you that because I think it does highlight the importance. So I'm firing now, and I'm literally about a millimeter, less than a millimeter, away from that posterior capsule. And yes? You have to sink behind the capacity, uh, so you won't keep the length. Slightly behind, about 150 micron offset. So with the offset and focusing just behind, then I march anteriorly with my joystick. So when, you're, when you have a float that's right behind the lens, if you fire behind it where you're safe, and then you start to march anteriorly, you can then see it all of a sudden hit the floater. So I go from behind to front. Again, I, this is more advanced techniques, but the reason why I wanted to show this to you was to show you that the plasma spark is so concentrated that even if you're a millimeter behind the lens, you're not gonna hit it. So it shows us how efficient that energy is. Now this is another video from a colleague of mine. This is actually Dr. Dimitrio showing you kind of his, his uh, B-scan view when he's firing the laser, how little movement is occurring. He, this is a very posterior floater. See how close it is to the retina? And very little movement. All this stuff here is not moving at all when he's firing. It's pretty amazing on how quiet the eye is. Now compare that to a vitrector. Now this is not to dis vitrectomy me at all, but if you look at vitrectomy machines, if you look here, that's a vitrector. Pulling, cutting, pulling, cutting. <coughs> So when people make an analogies to, well, vitrectomy has this risk, why doesn't vitrolysis have that same risk? It's because it's not the same mechanism. Not to say that vitrectomy is a bad, bad issue, or a bad procedure, it's just not the same mechanism. We're not pulling and cutting, we're severing. So a different mechanism, different pathology, uh, and different act activities are going on there as well. Does that make sense? Sort of. Any questions on that so far? All right. So. We'll go to data, but uh, how are we doing so far? Food's good? Good food? Yeah, yeah. awesome, yeah. awesome, good. Any other questions at all? So anything else that didn't make sense? I don't, wanna, I don't wanna push too fast, so whatever you guys wanna ask, I'm good. Okay, okay. Well, let's talk about data, because data, of course, is what we all rely on to, to prove that something is safe. You can believe me, but let's talk about data. So one of the data sets that I, I do like to start out with is a, is a data that was published in 2017 in JAMA uh, last summer. And it was by a group in Boston, the retina group in Boston, by Chirag Shah and his group. And it's a really important study. The reason why it was the first study that actually was published using new technology. Every study out there with YAG picture license in its name was done with laser technology that was not optimized like I just showed you here. So it's comparing apples to oranges in terms of safety and efficacy of both of these. So what this study was also important was because it was a placebo-controlled trial, meaning 
When people ask me all the time, do you really think you're doing something? If you just fired a pretend shot, these people are crazy. They'd say, oh, thank you, I'm better now, right? The perception is they're crazy people. Well, if you have a placebo-controlled trial, you account for that variable. So, oh, came out here. So, in, I'll, I'll just verbally talk about it. So in this study, it was a placebo-controlled trial. One arm was treated with a filter, so no energy got in the eye, but the patients thought they were getting treated. The other eye was treated, these were for Weiss rings, was treated for standard protocol, five, six millijoules starting. Long story short, I'll turn to the data. The data basically supports that looking at VFQ questionnaires, right, NEI questionnaires, looking at optos images, uh, reading speed, uh, looking at patient satisfaction scores, they found a statistical difference between the treated arm and the non treated arm. In fact, 0% of patients got better in the placebo arm. And so the important thing about this study was not only to show it worked, it also showed zero adverse events in the treated arm. Zero. This is a retina group. Now, it was only granted six, six month follow up, but no detachments, no tears, no inflammation, no pressure spikes, nothing. And so it was, a, it was a safety study primarily, but also an efficacy study comparing placebo. So now we have published data that shows that it works and it's safe. Is it working? It's just overheating. It's overheating? Oh, okay. I'm making it too hot, I'm too excited. That's a problem. All right. So we'll move on to another study here in a second. Okay. accepted as a paper presentation. We looked at 362 of our patients prospectively, and these are our initial patients in, this, in, the, in these studies. And all we did was very simple. We just want to look and see what was the satisfaction scores and look at safety and efficacy. We found, we asked patients yes or no, did this procedure make a difference? 93% of patients said yes, it made a difference. When we asked them how much of a difference did it make, average of about 70% after one session, after multiple sessions, about 90%. So it does show that not every single patient will be 100% better, not at all. Majority of patients are extremely satisfied. The key is differentiating Weiss rings or solitary masses or opacities versus larger clouds. In Weiss rings, by 1.3 sessions were needed. So majority of patients with the Weiss ring, after one session, they're happy and they're content, you can, you're done. With amorphous strings and clouds, we needed about three sessions to keep them extremely happy. Now, the caveat to this, it doesn't mean that after one session they were not happy. Bless you. It means that they were not 100% happy, they wanted more done. So I tell patients who have amorphous clouds, I say, look, in our studies, it showed us that we may need more than one session to get rid of everything. But hopefully after each individual session, you notice a significant improvement. As long as they say, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense, then handling that why do I still have some left over is easy. And I also tell them that we're breaking up floaters and we're vaporizing, but I can't break and vaporize every single piece at the same time. I may miss some, some may fly away. So it's okay if you have a couple remnants. In the studies, majority of patients with Weiss rings, if they had remnants, they went away after six months on their own. If they didn't go away, then we were able to do a second session and get rid of the small pieces. So I, that's why I love Weiss rings as an initial starting point for people, because it's easy to see easy to correlate with patient symptoms. They are very, very uh, amenable to the procedure, react very well to the laser, and less number of shots are needed. An average of less than 200 shots we needed to get rid of a Weiss ring, versus uh, used to over 500 shots for those amorphous clouds. The amount of average energy I use right now is about five to six millijoules. That's my sweet spot. Go ahead. What's your endpoint for the first session? For the which one? For the first session. First session for the clouds. So if it's a cloud-like floater, depends on, this is where it's tricky, it depends on what the goal is at first. So sometimes you have a large cloud mass. My initial goal is to debulk it and maybe move it out of the way. Now, I have gone up to 2,000 shots at one session. I've learned, and I'll show you my adverse event profile, the, the, the higher number of shots, the more likelihood of a pressure spike. So I've limited now to about five or 600 shots for people, not that you have to, but I limit it to that. So I have about five or six hundred shots. I said, That's okay. The end of your fish. It's yeah. It's not, not a not not a steadfast rule, but I recommend that for most people. Stop around that, and then say, okay, let's have you come back and see how you're doing. When? 
And, okay, so follow up. So now the follow up, and we'll get to that in a second, but the follow up, it depends on you. In my initial studies, we had them come back within a week to see the pressure and look at the retina. I don't do that anymore because we now have seen the safety being so good. I have them come back within three to four weeks. I check the retina, check the pressure, check the symptomology. At that point, we make a decision. Should we wait and see how you do? Are you happy? Or should we do more? Because what will happen? I like waiting because a lot of times, especially with the amorphous clouds, with the amorphous clouds, what will happen is they will break apart and they say, Doc, this was great. You did a great job. Then what will happen? All of a sudden, they say in a few weeks, it starts to come back again. Because whatever pieces you broke apart that you did not vaporize, they like to come back together again. And so giving them about a month to allow those changes to occur allows you to see what's gonna happen, what's their natural history, then make that decision. So whatever you feel comfortable, I did OCTs pre and post just to be safe. And again, it's not a steadfast rule. Whatever you need to do to make yourself feel comfortable, this is safe. So I, I use a week at first and then I do a month to have it come back. Oh, we lost it. Okay, I'm just gonna keep going on just for safety. Um, so, safety. Have anything bad happened? Yes. Is, is there anything bad that happened that was worrisome to me? No, but there's an adverse event profile. Very, very good profile. Uh, in our studies, 0.8%. Now, what are the adverse events? I hit one retina. And I'm gonna show you, hopefully. <laughs> I hope I show you the video. The retina I hit was not because a laser apparently fired. It was because I was focused, literally focused on the retina when I hit it. And I'll show you a video to see. That was my fault and I'll explain. Thank you. Number two, we have hit two lenses. Now, why? When LX came out with this laser system, what did they say? They were pushing, pushing coaxial, coaxial, coaxial. Remember, I was the first one in the United States to use it. So I was pushing coaxial. Well, guess what? I couldn't see where the poster capsule was. So I hit two lenses. Then I realized, wait a minute, this is stupid. How can we be using coaxial for everybody? What if it's right by the lens? Let's move it oblique. Once I started using the oblique method and titrating illumination, I have not hit a lens since then. You saw that video of how close I can go now. I have a much better appreciation of where the posture capsule is. I'll show you those two pictures of the, of the lenses I hit. The last thing I do see, and I've seen in some studies, is pressure spikes. Now in this first 362 patients, we actually did see three patients that had significant pressure spikes in the 40s, in the 50s. And they were specifically in pseudophagic post yag capsulotomy patients where the floaters are right behind the lens and there are more amorphous clouds. It wasn't the energy, amount of energy, it was the number of shots. I was doing over almost a thousand shots in these patients. So now what I've done is I've limited those patients to 300 shots, 350, if they're right behind the lens. Not that they have to, but that has eliminated that pressure spike issue. So I limited it to about three, uh, 300 to 400 shots, 350, to be safe. Now, well, there's another study that we presented at ASCRS in 2017, last year, that was a retrospective study. This is also accepted as a paper presentation. And basically, this looked at over 1,200, almost 1,300 cases, up to four-year follow-up in about 200 of them. And what I wanted to show you was, this included the first 362 patients, that, well, that's these two, the pressure spikes went to seven. So out of the first 1,200 cases, about seven had a pressure spike. Again, it's the number of shots more than energy levels. But if you look at other parameters too, we have not seen any inflammatory reaction. No AC reaction, no vitreous reaction. Because we're not firing any uveal tissue, we're not firing in the retina, we're firing in the collagen matrix where there's no inducement of inflammation. We've had four people with history of uveitis, no exacerbation. We've had diabetic patients, no worsening of their, of their diabetes, and even people with a history of CSME that did not get worse. And so I do think it's important to not fire on anybody who has active disease, active CSA, CSME or CME or CNBM, but if it's quiescent and quiet, I do feel comfortable firing those patients as well. Now, for the pressure spikes, they're all medically managed, no one needed surgery, but I will say that two patients are still on medications. They're controlled, but they still need medication. So we're not sure if it's debris that's coming around and blocking the trabecular meshwork, or if it's the gas bubbles. My guess is debris because it's lasting more than a few months and why the pressure goes up. So just be careful, not too many shots if it's right behind the lens. So here are the two lenses I hit, by the way. Just so you guys can see, this one I hit, 
in the periphery of the lens in a, in a mild NS patient, young 50 plus year old patient. Now, luckily, it was in the periphery and it was more in the nucleus and guess what? The patient's still doing fine. Has no symptomology, it's in the periphery, I'm watching it. This patient here on the right, unfortunately, did end up needing cataract surgery, had significant glare and halos and decreased vision the next day, about 2050 from 2020. So we did cataract removal, I put a, I put a sulcus lens, I did a little anterior vitrectomy just to remove any vitreous there, and patient's doing great. But uh, you better be careful, and that's if you don't use that off-axis approach, that is a risk, which is why we always recommend picking pseudophagic patients if possible at first. Here's a video of, of hitting the retina. Here we go. Let me show you this. So now, this video, I, I, I take fair and balance. I screwed up. I should out of fire. This is my fault, right? I thought I could get by, but you know what? It happens. Even though, even though the floater is, you see that little thing right there? When you see that retina that in focus, it is not worth firing. If you see the retina like that, leave it alone. Tell the patient, sorry. Now luckily this was a nasal retina, and luckily this was a small spot you'll see. The patient had no problem, but as I start firing here, I'm not even firing at the floater, I'm actually firing, I'm only focused on the retina right now. And I'm firing, and you'll see a white spot form right there, a white spot. So I'm actually focused more on the retina than the floater. Now, I freaked out, my heart sank, and then I said, okay, stop for a second. Put pressure, I kept the pressure for five minutes. There's a small red spot that formed there. That red spot is the biggest I got. It went away, patient had no issues at all, scar down, we couldn't even tell. There's been no reported cases of anyone hitting the retina that led to a detachment or tear. But it can happen, not because a laser was dangerous, that's because I chose a fire on a retina, right? I was that close. That's why if you see the retina in focus, just don't fire. That's, that's the main message. If the retina's out of focus, you're fine. You did not get a hole. No hole. And I, I, I actually, so we have an international ophthalmic floater society, and we polled many different doctors around the world who've ever hit the retina. And so far, from my knowledge, there's no reported cases of those retina hits there inducing a tear or hole or causing a permanent hole. It scars down. So that's a good thing versus like a traction or detachment or tear. Uh, we don't see these holes causing a problem. Any other questions on adverse events so far? So pressure spikes, hitting the lens, and uh, uh, hitting the retina. So would you do it in a floater that's in front of the <coughs> So if it's in front of the macula, if the floater is in front, I'm gonna show you the video after this as well. If it's in front of the fovea, right in the center there, if I see the fovea in focus, absolutely, yeah, don't do it. <laughs> it's not worth it. Because if you hit if you hit the retina on the periphery, fine. You feel bad, but the patient will never have a symptom. If you hit the, you know, if you hit the fovea, you're screwed, you're done. So if it's where I can't see the floater, I can't, I can't see the retina at all, then absolutely, or if it's very obscured, I'm fine. But if it's clear enough where I can see it, what I do is I manipulate the floater. So these lenses that we have are cut to the eye because of the little cup that it has. And you can actually go like this, shape the eye, and believe it or not, a convection current occurs. I'll show you a video in a second. where the floater comes like this, comes around, and then it, it comes more anterior, or it'll move away from the from the fovea. A lot of these flo floaters are mobile enough where you can manipulate it to get it away from the fovea. So yes, when in doubt, if you see the fovea in decent focus, it's not even worth it, it's not. I've, I've had two patients where I couldn't move it out of the way, and it was so close to the fovea, I said, you know what, I'm sorry. I'd rather say I didn't do a good job for you than say I hurt you. <laughs> That's my main focus is safety, so very good point. Okay, well moving on, I know it's getting kind of late here, but I wanted to share with you about the, some of the data points that uh, allow us to show the quality of vision assessments. Because one thing I realized early on was patients would come in and say, Doc, I can see better quality of vision. Even though the, on the charts they were seeing the same, their quality was better. And I, I was wondering why. So we use the uh, machine called the eye trace. Have anyone heard of the eye trace by Tracy Technologies? So the eye trace is a machine that's a, a, a wave front apparometer, basically. And what it does is ray tracing. From front to back, it shines 256 lasers into the eye, and it looks at where they end up on the retina, point spread function. It also looks at the size and the intensity of the light hitting the retina. So we can look at contrast, we can look at loss, right, of a light source. So it also has a topographer. By having a topographer, it can separate cornea versus internal quality of vision. So let me show you this real quick. This is kind of interesting. So this is one of the screens, the many different screens we get with the eye trace. So this is the representative E, 
right? This is the topography, right? This is a cornea. This is the internal. This is your pupil size, what we call the opacity map of the lens. This is the representative E. This number here is called a DLI. Basically, anything behind the cornea all the way to the retina is the internal optics, so lens vitreous. It takes into account higher order aberrations, MTF curves, all those, and puts it into a number system, basically, uh, basically a nomogram. And the lower that number, the worse the quality of your internal optics is. So this is 3.79, which is very low. Anything below six is considered significant. So very low. This is a total between cornea and internal, give you a total. And uh, it has a refraction. It has higher order aberrations, cornea versus internal. So we can look at cornea aberrations versus internal. Now this is a patient pre-op, undilated, for an amorphous cloud in the middle of the vitreous. Now this study we did had amorphous clouds in the middle of the vitreous, not white rings. And if you look down here, it's hard to see with this slide, but basically, Where's my, there you go. So there here, the cornea aberration says 0.083. Internal is 0.195. So near, near 0.2, which is a lot for, for these, for these for aberrations. Post-op, next day, undilated. Not only do you see this DLI go up to 10, look at the aberration. The cornea did not change, 0.089. Internal went from 0.195 to 0.087. So all we changed was the internal quality of vision. The cornea and topography did not change. You look at the MTF curves. This is the MTF curve here. Pre-op, you see, are you familiar with MTF curves, everybody? So modular transfer function. What this basically means is how far away do two objects have to be before we can differentiate the two. So the, the, cl the closer they are, the harder to identify. The difference. So at 10 cycles per degree, you want to be about 0.6, is what well considered normal. Pre-op, you see that's the MTF curve. <coughs> Post-op, you see we improved it significantly. The area under the curve improved significantly. Look at the refraction. It did not change. So we didn't change refraction, didn't change topography. All we saw was an HOA improving internally, and you see MTF curves improving. So these are the kind of data sets that show us that we're not just making people feel better, truly quality of vision has improved. And in the study that was presented also at AAO, we found that 30, uh, 36 patients who had um, this cloud in the middle of interest, 33 had a significant improvement in DLI or in HOA or area under the curve. So we're seeing now quality of vision assessments showing a benefit. Here's another fun example of looking at OCTs. Here's a, a patient that we had that had this large U-shaped floater. Now, this patient actually had been to optometry and ophthalmologist and had MRI done, had fluorescent angiography done. People couldn't figure out, had OCT angiography done, no one could figure out. Until I looked at the patient and I said, hey, there's a floater here, and look, at these two first two lines, you see a sh these shadows here. The last two lines, no shadow. Your scotoma is because of the floater. I use OCT to define that. So I said, okay, let me do this. I'm gonna go ahead and laser this part here and see if I can get rid of those shadows. And look what happened. Post-op, I got rid of the main area here. See the two edges are still there? The shadows are gone. And this patient had their symptoms resolved. Said, oh my God, my blind spot's gone. That big area's gone. So again, nice to show that OCT can also give us some hints as to what is happening in these patients as well. So, how do you start? To me, the consult is a very, very, probably the most important part of the exam. Making sure that we can, number one, visualize the floaters. Make sure you can see what the patient's complaining about. History taking, asking the patient, where does it come from? Where do you see it? When do you see it? Does it come from down below or up top, down to bottom? Do you see it when you're reading? Does it come to the middle? Those are all symptoms that can help you identify which floater, if there's many different floaters, or just help you identify where the floater might be, if it's like a white ring, let's say. Number two, I look at the location. Is the location close to the lens, close to the retina? If it's too close to one of those structures, I'll show you a video in a second, it's not worth doing it. But also, I look at these things. If it's larger, denser, there's more number of them, I then tell a patient ahead of time, there's a likelihood I might have to do more than one session, just so you know why. From a safety perspective, we don't want to do too many shots, and this is why you might have some, some, some more sessions of need. Now, here's what I do preoperatively. I assess, especially if it's too close to the lens. And I'll show you here an example of where you do not want to treat. Again, there's a lens capsule, there's these floaters right there. These kind of floaters that are strings and lines, especially younger patients, are tough to do. 
Don't do those. You can try it, I have tried it, but those little springs and floaters can be hard, especially when you're right by the lens. You don't feel as comfortable being as aggressive. It might cause you more heartache than anything else. So I avoid that. Very little space between the lens and the floater. Here's a, another one where I've tried, I can, you can do it, but be careful also. I'll wait until you feel much more comfortable. Here, these strings also take a number of sessions. Right? These are these string-like floaters we talked about, those amorphous clouds. But you do have a little more space, but again, still not a lot of space between those floaters and the lens capsule. Here's where I would recommend, as you, after you feel more comfortable, in the third one, on the right. This one on the right here, you can see, has a more space between the lens and the floater, and these floaters are more consolidated, more clumped together. That's a lot easier to get to than those little strings and fibers all the time. So again, assessing these things takes time. And you will start to notice some work better than others. And that's where your gestalt comes in and your learning experience will help you to guide which patients to pick in the future as well. Paul, do you use less power when you are near the lens and near the retina? Yes, good question. So the question was, how much power do you use if you're close to the lens versus the retina? So I will tend to use a little bit less power if I'm closer to the lens. I'll go from, let's say, if it's in the middle of vitreous, I'll be at six millijoules or so. I'll be at four if it's close to the lens. And if it's further back, very close to the lens, not close, but like within a few millimeters of the retina, I might go to seven and do an anterior offset. So you can play with energies. And this is why when we talk about the type of patient to pick, in fact, I'll fast forward to that here just for the sake of time. Uh, there we go. So pseudophagic patients are great. Why? Because you don't have to worry about the lens. Give yourself the first 10 or 20 patients to just play with it. You know, you have a pseudophagic patient, start to look on and off axis and where the floater is. Maybe fire closer to the lens to see kind of what happens. Because the worst thing you hit a, a lens, you pit a lens, they're not gonna have symptoms. So it's important to kind of use that time with those pseudophagic patients to learn how to maximize your view. And then you can see firing closer to the lens, you go down in power, further back, higher power. White rings or any solitary opacity, Always an easier way to do it because you can correlate symptoms and it's easier to see the resolution and the feedback of what to end your session is much easier than a large cloud. You know, if it's dense, it's fine. It may take one of our shots as well. But also, no new PVDs. I'm a big fan of saying if someone comes in and say, Doc, two weeks ago I had this new floater and flashes, and now it's better, but my floater's still there, I still say wait for three or four months. I don't do anyone who just has a sudden PVD. Wait Why? for three or four months. Okay, tell you why. Number one is I want to recheck the retina again in a few months to make sure that I didn't miss anything, more for me. Also, I want to give them a chance to neuroadapt because I have found a significant portion of patients where they come back and they say, hey doc, you know what? I don't see it anymore. They neuroadapted. So I give them an opportunity to neuroadapt. If they come back in three or four months, the retina looks fine and they are still having symptoms, then we say, fine, we gave you a chance. The retina is still stable and we go ahead and do a, do a session if we need to as well. So that's the primary goal. Number two, I do think it's important if it's not easy to view in the slit lamp, if you're struggling at your slit lamp exam to find the floater, it's not worth doing. Make sure you have very easy to see the, the floater and you feel comfortable with it. Because, and also take your lens, the same lens, whatever lens we use, and try it uh, at your consult. Tell the patient, this is the lens I'm gonna use when I do the procedure. I wanna look at through this view so I can get an expectation of what to expect when I'm there at the laser. So before you start your first few cases, try that lens because it is a different view. And I mag up. For my YAG capsulotomies, I'm only at a 10 times mag. For my visual eyes, I go to 16 times mag. So all those videos was a 16 times magnification versus a 10 mag like a YAG capsulotomy. So that's a very, a very important concept too, to change your magnification as well. The last thing here in the slide, if someone comes in like that and says, Doc, I have this, 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 send them to you guys. <laughs> Petrectomy time, or not, I'm not doing it. Because these patients, you can't make happy. If they have so many different shots everywhere, they're miserable as well. And so don't be afraid to go to higher energy levels, seven, eight millijoules. I know it sounds like a lot, but honestly, if you do two or three millijoules, you're gonna be there forever and it's gonna be pushing the floater away. Just gonna fade here, fast forward through here. There is a safe zone. Asteroid halinosis, not sure how effective that is. I've done about maybe four or five patients. I've had one that made a little difference, but not as successful with asteroids. People with thin strings, a dot here, those younger 40-year-olds, 30-year-old patients, 
they tend to be harder to please. You can get them a little happier, but they tend to always have a small screen that bothers them. So be careful on who you pick, especially early on, to maximize your outcomes as well. And then a couple of basic curls for your office. I don't schedule them throughout the day. I have laser days, laser mornings, where I schedule a bunch of them to come in, we dilate them all, and do a laser, next, next, like an assembly line. So do them before clinic starts or after clinic ends, so it's easier, it doesn't interfere with my, my daily routine. It takes me five minutes to do a YAG, visualize now for a wise room. But early on, it may take me 20 minutes. Why? Because you're trying to figure out how to put the lens on the eye, how to view it, looking, you're so nervous to fire that first shot. Give yourself that extra time just to be safe. Also, I have a tech holding the head. I always think, even though the straps, having a tech to remind the patient they stay still does help a great deal. And then I place anesthetic in both eyes. Even though we're only treating one eye, I do the anesthetic in the other eye as well because it helps them keep their eyes open and doesn't get the other eye to water and burn and tear. The patients will say that Doc, after, after they wake up, they get out of the laser, it's dark, I can't see, it's black. Don't worry, that lasts for about five minutes, it comes back again. There's from all the flashes of light, they do tend to have a little darkening, so it takes some time for it to come back. And they may see some bubbles. They may say, Doc, I see a bunch of stuff on the floor. That's because plasma rises. So you'll see the gas bubbles up in the top, which is bottom in their vision. So they may say, hey doc, I see all these things. They may call you that night. So I tell them ahead of time, don't worry. You may see a bunch of stuff in the bottom. And usually by the next day, the next morning, they, they are, are resolved. Any questions at all? Make sense? We're good? Okay. Well, okay, last thing here. I'm not sure this will show up here. I don't, I don't show testimonials a lot uh, in my slide presentations because I think, you know, take it or leave it. But I do think, this one is very important for me because it's a vitreo, this is a, sorry, an anterior segment cataract refractive surgeon in our area. And he, high volume, does about probably 50 or 60 a week minimum. That's all he does is cataract surgery. He stopped doing cataract surgeries because he said the flows were getting in, this, in the way. And so he had multifocal lenses put in a few years back and said, Doc, he said, Paul, I can't see. So he had a vitrectomy set up already at the university. He came to me to see if I could do something for him. So here's a testimonial. I'm not sure if he'll play. I'm planning on a tracking potential. That's right. My vitreous, my vitreous floaters were severe enough that I felt they, they interfered with me occasionally uh, during cataract surgery and in the microscope. It was not the implants at all. It was the floaters because I could move my eyes and actually in cataract surgery obtain again the cl uh, clear enough picture that I was confident of what I was doing. But, but having gone back and forth with, with this uh, bothered me because I knew in my heart I wasn't seeing what I should see for consistent quality under the scope. Discussed this with a vitreo retinal surgeon from the university and, and he said, Jack, if it bothers you that much, let's give it six months and if you need to, I'll go in and do a, a, a vitrectomy uh, for you. And I thought that's what I'm going to have to do if I'm going to continue to operate with consistency because I didn't want to jeopardize my patients. So I underwent a vitreo lysis first because it's a much simpler thing. It's been sufficient. It's been it's been quite dramatic, actually, more than sufficient. And, then, and I feel very good about the quality of my vision under a microscope. It solved it. Yeah. And, and there is a threshold. It isn't perfect. I still have some floaters. Sure. But there is a threshold where it is such an improvement that you reach a threshold where you say, this is great. I can live with this. It isn't interfering with I mean, So qual quality of life is really the idea, and, and so for a surgeon for, to have that perspective, you know, it made me realize how much of an impact these floors can have on daily functionality as well. So uh, I'm gonna leave it for more questions. This is just some slides showing that we have an International Ophthalmic Floor Society that's now created, and the goals of the society here are really to help, we wanna educate, we wanna get more understanding of vitreous and floaters, kind of creating more objective questionnaires, specifically designed for floaters, do more studies as well. So please keep in touch if you're interested. Love to have you guys join the society. We're gonna meet uh, at ESCRS in September. And usually we meet at Academy in the US sometime in the fall as well. Uh, so there's our first meeting we had. And uh, again, that's there. And I'm just gonna fast forward to my email address. Please feel free to email me anytime. I can send you videos, consent forms. Uh, if you have any questions on, on uh, per first case, please feel free. I'll love to answer any questions you have. Okay. Well, great. Now, please, any, any questions you have right now? Any thoughts, comments? You made us richer. Huh? <laughs> you made us richer by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it'll help. Hopefully it'll help clear up what is different about this pr procedure and the technology as well. There's a lot to it. But you'll love it. Just give yourself the learning curve. Give yourself 10, 20 patients. 
understand, pick the right patients, and you will and have confidence that you will not hit anything if you're in the middle of a tris, and you'll be amazed at how happy these patients are. <coughs> Yes. So uh, the question was, if you're doing multiple sessions, that's a great 